go. Um, but we'll come back to the bakery. That's where you come in the morning for your coffee. And your right over here. Guys, get their chops. So if you want like new and exciting kind of up and coming sushi guys, that's where you go. And they're good. They're really good. I like to give them a chance to show their stuff. Is that it grows in land and in water. And the reason that's so important is because you know how most crops, when they're ready and they're ripe, you gotta pick them, you gotta either preserve them or eat them, you gotta do something with it. The water that comes from the mountains is so cold that it naturally preserves the taro in the ground until they're ready to, to harvest it. So, yes, uh huh. It's like a, it's a tuber, it's a root that grows underground. And it's really cool because it's, very high in calcium, very high in minerals, fiber, uh, vitamins. It's very nutrient dense. And the mythology is kind of interesting. Um, the Hawaiian god actually, I forget his name, you guys, I gotta work on my mythology. But the main Hawaiian god had a child and the child was deformed and he passed away. And when they buried the baby, the ground actually, that's where the first taro plant grew from. And it was so nutritious that all his other children were very, very strong and his whole bloodline was very strong and victorious. So it, it goes deep back into the roots of Hawaii, of course. The thing that amazes me is when you think of Polynesia, you think of the, the navigators coming from, you know, navigating from the stars, from Tahiti, from Polynesia and coming here. I always think of them as sailors, as navigators. I never really thought of them as master farmers and agriculturalists, but we have some of the most amazing food we enjoy today is because these people actually took their little seedlings and their dried seeds and brought them all the way here across the ocean and allowed them to propagate. So the canoe crops are like the, the bananas, the coconuts, the taro, the ginger. So, you know, the ginger is the avocado, the, no the noni, the olena, the, the I love the noni, it's such a, um, <coughs> excuse me, I get all excited when I talk about noni. Noni is a um, particular type of food that um, adapts, it's an adaptogen. So wherever you're inherently weak, the noni is going to strengthen your hereditary makeup. So it's very potent, very powerful. And then the coconuts, the avapui, the ginger, the olena, the, um, the turmeric, the, um, the breadfruit, the ulu. So um, just the pigs, the chickens, and much of what we enjoy today is really from these amazing people that came from Polynesia all the way over here and brought this stuff on their food. So quite remarkable. Very different when you look at like the, um, the people that they paid to come work on the sugar cane farms, the sugar cane plantations from Japan and China and the Philippines, from Spain, from Europe, from all over the world. It was one of the first places in the world that they paid workers to come here and work. And so they brought all their own food traditions. And that's why you have everything from bok choy and, you know, saimin to like Kahlua pork to, I mean, it's just a melting pot of different foods. And that's, that's breakfast, any type breakfast fare. And then we do lunches in the afternoon. Also, we do personal sized pizzas, some panini sandwiches and some salads. We're looking forward to expanding our, our offerings in the future. We also this is bar so this is bar right here, and then the bread company is just right next door where the white railing is. And you guys are going to get a chance to walk over there and walk through and check it all out and see what we've got over there too. But all the stuff that you're eating right now is all made over at the bread company. We do serve some of the same things here at Barracuda because we make them at the bread company. So like we make the bread that Barracuda uses for all of their dishes that you bread, we make their bread. Uh, we make all of the desserts for Barracuda as well. So there will sometimes be a little overlap, like the coconut macaroons. They always have coconut macaroons here at Barracuda as well. It's kind of been one of our signature things for years, is the coconut macaroons. Uh, so we're still making those. 
some things are only available over at the bread company, though. <laughs> like the banana bread, you can only get at the bread company. You can't get it at Burger. And at the time, when they took over, him and his wife, they had like one of those rotisserie hot dog things where it went around in a circle, you know, and then the pizza went through a conveyor belt, and everything was just like low, low cost, low value, kind of low everything, low quality. And because he and his wife like to travel around, and they're foodies, right? So she organizes the activities on vacation, and Darren organizes the food when they're on vacation. So anyway, he's kind of incorporated his mother's style of cooking. She's from Tonga, and his father's from Texas, and he grew up here in Hawaii, and he's traveled the world. So he incorporates all his favorite little things that he finds around the world, and brings it back, and uses it here. <laughs> so it's to our benefit that he's a great foodie. And when you come here, this is the, on the North Shore, this is where you come again. I mentioned it before. This is the distributorship for the North Shore for the Kauai beef. So it's the grass-fed Kauai beef. And you can get steaks in the refrigerator, throw so them on the grill if you want, or get the hamburger meat to make your own burgers. Or you can come here and, and order their pig lunches and get their wonderful pizzas. So apparently what he did is he kept trying with all the different flowers, all the different flowers for the um, pizza crust. And he finally figured out that it's a slightly more expensive flour that has a little more gluten in it. And he orders it from some California and he does it twice a month. It's this big deal to get the perfect kind of flour for his crust. But the biggest issue of getting the crust perfect happened to be with um, the cooking technique. So he went from one little machine, one little oven to another oven. So finally he just broke down, went to New York and, and had a pizza oven built for this place and they shipped it over on the slow boat. So I hope you enjoy it. I think that's what we're going to try today. Anyway, we'll see if they have a store. The biggest selling item here is by far the chili pepper chicken. And it's hilarious. If you talk to you know local people that grew up here and ask them what to eat for lunch, <laughs> nine out of ten are going to say chili pepper chicken at the gas station. <laughs> it's kind of funny. So all it is is like um, fried chicken, but it has the nice tangy uh, sauce. It's kind of spicy, you know. But they, they chicken in there. So this is it. This is the little spot. You ask many, many people on Kauai, on the North Shore, and they're going to tell you this is where to come for lunch or for dinner. So this is our spot, and happy to share. My wife and I told me seven years ago. I'm like, oh, my God, that's insane. I want to make it, but it's not dehydrated, per se. It's caramelized. So you got to play with caramelization, 375 degrees. Anyway, they're left with brown sugar at 375 degrees. Molten lava has nothing on this stuff, man. It burnt all the way to the bone. It was like amazing. So now everything is slow motion, all right? So there you go. I'm going to start you up. Good morning. Watch out. And uh, so uh, what we do is we I caramelize the white coconuts and I dredge them with some brown cane sugar. And then we caramelize them in the oven uh, for X amount of time until they're done. Not done, done, but then I put them in the dehydrator overnight to science them up a little bit so it cures the sugars. You'll see. It's amazing. And I'm playing with different flavors. We're going to do an espresso coconut candy that I ran out. I didn't make this week. It'll bust over the years. And so how's that for about five chews, huh? Crazy, huh? I know. So it's been a fun ride just creating products and stuff, you know, and, and working with my family. That's what I wanted to do. Uh, when I grew up, everything was a Sears or JC. Everything was made in America, you know what I mean? And we're all complaining, but we're at Walmart lined up in line getting the cheapest possible stuff we can get. Same with the food, you know? We're all complaining about food, but we're buying this stuff. But I promise, if we could quit buying the bad food, they would quit making it today. They're, they're, they're customer-driven. So I'm just trying to do it right, and we do it in low temperatures. We don't put anything on it, and uh, we're just trying to turn people on to a, a really essential food because everything was brought here. Every fruit, everything, coconut floated here, but everything else was brought by canoe or plane or boat. And it just grows as well or better here than it did anywhere else in the world. We have a 365-day growing season. So all I'm doing is kind of preserving the essence of this, this place. People around the world feel it when they open it up in Germany or Czech Republic or in every, even Brazil. You know, they get attitude, right? They, that's where the mangoes came from, right? So they just go, oh my God, this is really good. So the process so is So that being said, we, uh, I have, I brought some goodies along to buy if you guys wanted to, to, to take home as gifts. And uh, I also, 
when I started my business plan, I thought working with stores was going to be the good thing to do. But I realized early on that there's no scale because it's all hand cut, hand packed. So the more stores, there's more hand packed, hand cut. And the kids are going, hey, you know, I got a life here. So what I do now is I have a subscription plan where people can get it directly from me to them anywhere in the world monthly and they get a little batch of Aloha every month so it's working out really well the margins are better and they don't have to wait 60 to 75 days from these stores that have more money than God to trickle down on me you know it's brutal so I brought some goodies and if you guys have any questions I'm happy happy to answer anything but everything was sourced here in Hawaii most everything is on Kauai I climbed for a lot of that those star fruit I climbed those trees um, I'll climb for, I make guava leather. Um, I picked a lot of mangoes this year, but the pineapples come from Oahu or Maui. Uh, but I, they haven't had anything from Maui since Hurricane Lane. They got so flooded out and wiped out that it literally, it took them out. You know, they haven't harvested since Hurricane Lane. So I get the pineapples from um, Oahu, North Shore. So it's been a fun ride. I love doing what we do. And it's something I'm going to hand off to the kids. I got grandkids that are stamping, I mean, they're all cockeyed, they're not even doing it right, but they're participating. So I'm exploiting generations of this family right here. And it's something that, it's a fun thing that we all talk about, we do as a family unit, which is a long lost art here, and I think we, we got to get back to that. So I did bring some goodies, so these, this is a quarter pound of coconut candy, usually sells for about ten bucks. In the stores I'm selling them for five, for you guys, for the food tour. And this is a half pound of pineapple, papaya, coconut, Star fruit, just what you had. They sell from nineteen to twenty-three dollars in the stores. I'm doing for twelve fifty. So I have. If you guys want to pick up? I have good ones of Tiki Place back from the fifties in the basement of the Fairmont Hotel in San Francisco, right on Knob Hill. And the, the, the Tom Room has like every twenty minutes they have a full rainstorm, and it's got. A bunch of canals that the, they got a little cut, cut boat that the band sits on and it cruises around these uh, lagoons and, and wonderful waterways and plays music to the diners as they're doing. They've been doing this for close about 60 years or more now. So Michelle wanted to do this, but they couldn't really do it until their youngest son Reebok was out of high school and into college and safely tucked away in his own pursuits. And that happened like two months, seven years ago. It took a couple of years to build in here. We got the grandson of the designer of uh, Adventureland the Disney Life. And the grandson and son of the designers of the Enchanted Tiki Room at Disneyland. So Bamboo Ben, who is responsible for the look of the place, is a third generation Tiki guy. Now, Tiki, where does that come from? What's it out of right? Well, I'll tell you. We have to spin the way back machine over to this imaginary dial. <laughs> way back, way back. I'm not even here. 1935. 1935 was the year that Don the Beach Coker opened up his first restaurant in Long Beach, California. Now, why did he open it up? I'll tell you. We'll, we'll, we have to spin the dial again. Come back to about 1928. 1928, he's with his grandfather on a wooden ship sailing through the Caribbean because you couldn't do alcohol in America. But everybody wanted to do alcohol in America, so he became a run runner during Prohibition. He would sail on that wooden ship throughout the Caribbean and buy loads of rum from different islands and different places and bring it in to New Orleans. And they had a fabulous gig going on. It was really not much, uh, no other competition. Until they came back from one voyage and Prohibition had been ended. So he has this half a load of booze in the base of his ship. And he's thinking with something I could really suck it for a lot more. Especially now that the market price has gone down in New Orleans. I can sell it for a lot more if I put them in the base and sold it by the shot glass instead of by the case. So he took that wooden ship, sailed it through the Panama Canal, and having always had an attraction for the South Pacific, he totally investigated, went around the different islands, met the people, found out what their recipes for drinks and things like that were food and drink. Bought up a bunch of the local art and sculpture, the tiki's and the wall hangings. And in 1935, we're just like back 
Let me just this. He's in Long Beach and he's going to open up his restaurant. It's a 13 foot wide by 30 foot long house. That the restaurant outgrew within six months. Within six months, they were opening up a new place in Beverly Hills. And they were the toast of town. Because in 35, it's also the Depression. The people can't go on exotic vacations to the South Pacific. But they can go for a lovely dinner at a place that's all South Pacific themed. It, it just got very, very, very popular. So popular that a restaurateur from Oakland, California, a guy named Vic Bergeron, ate there and decided, I really like this, I'm going to do something with my restaurant. But he didn't have the sculptures and the sort of South Pacific tchotchkes that Don the Beachcomber has. So he decided that he would make an offer if you, if you had that stuff at home and he wanted to bring it into his restaurant and donate it, he'd give you food and drink for it. And thereby he got the name Trader Vic. He was strictly this guy, he was a smart businessman, he loved what he saw. Now another thing that really helped the tiki culture and tiki thing happen in a bigger scale was World War II. In World War II, a number of GIs who were in the Pacific Theater came to associate having a really good solid rum drink with a sandy beach and a bamboo bar and palm trees swaying. They came to associate that with survival and the joy of having not been killed in the battle. They were just getting out of There was their R&R &R places and when they mustered out after the war ended, those guys would go home to the Midwest if they were in the Midwest and they had a basement, they'd build a tiki bar in the basement. If they were on the coasts, they'd have a patio or a lanai and they'd build a tiki bar outside. Tiki became a very big thing. So big that Popular Mechanics and Mechanics Illustrated, those sorts of magazines would feature how to build your own tiki bar. They would show, they have features like, you know, you'll see the light up here, it's a fishing club. Uh, it used to be entirely uh, round, but to get the electricity inside, you had to drill a hole in it. And those articles would explain exactly what size diamond bit drill you needed to drill through the glass and how much water you needed to have flushing over the outside of it so it didn't overheat and crack the whole thing. And next thing you know, there are tiki laundromats, tiki bowling alleys, whole apartment complexes with a tiki theme. Tiki restaurants and tiki bars growing up in every little town across America. It got so popular that uh, by the time the 60s hit, people had just done it. Oh, a guy named Martin Denny. Did I forget the music? Yeah. The guy named Martin Denny, who was a musician in the Don the Beachcombers restaurant on Oahu in Waikiki, invented a whole tiki music set. The Quiet Village. Those kind of like... And then the bird. I can't do the bird thing. He had, he had a horn player in his band who could uh, imitate birds really well with his mouth. And so that's what, what they did. We came, uh, like I said, about five years ago, Michelle opened up. When we got this place, we gutted the interior. We gutted it all the way down to the floor joists so that we could put new wood floors in and build, just change the flow of the, uh, the whole restaurant. She was able to uh, pick up some wonderful architectural artifacts from the Coco Palms Resort, which is where Elvis did his Blue Hawaii thing, and it was a, it was a very, very tiki in its own way. So on the other side of this door, above the door, there's uh, some architectural details that we were able to get from the Coco Palms. Also off to the right hand side, or is, when you're inside and you're looking up, you're looking right hand side, you'll see a couple of coconuts hanging. Those coconuts were featured in the, um, they were Johnny Depp's, or, or uh, Captain Jack Sparrow's. The ones he was juggling as he was being chased by the uh, one of the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. There are also a variety of uh, things that we have cleaned from other restaurants. The, uh, over the tiki, by where that gentleman is picking up dishes, that was carved in 1945 for Trader Vic's restaurant on Oahu. We have its uh, brother or sister, it's really hard to tell whether it's a brother or sister, down in the bar itself. Uh, along with a variety of different things, things that are neighborhood, where they have a uh, tiki bar. 
works, for example, you have to have drum lights. You see drum lights all around here. These were crafted by a gentleman from Nevada City, California, who comes annually to make sure that they're in good shape. If anything's uh, broken, he glues them back together. And uh, You also have to have a puffer fish, a fully inflated puffer fish with a lamp inside of it. And if you're looking, when you're done, please feel free to look around and check all the details. Um, so you'll see there's a puffer fish in the bar. But particular, of particular interest to me, because I, I just like the way crisis can create creative solutions. And when we had the plumbers, we thought the plumbers were done in the bathroom. And we put the pavers down, nice big italian ceramic pavers. And then the plumber said, no, well, we're not shaking enough quite done. So he had to knock a hole in them. And Michelle was freaking out. What are we going to do with this? A friend of hers who's an, an artist said, relax, Michelle, go home. I've got this covered. And over the weekend, over one particular weekend, she just smoothed the edges of the hole that was made and put some plywood underneath it and put in a mosaic into the floor of koi pump. Which is a really good, it's a really fun thing to see if you get the gentlemen, you might want to wait until the ladies have had their turn to make sure that uh, everything is clean and sanitary there. But it's a beautiful thing to see. We also have a variety of uh, clubs that Michelle and Todd, when they were prepping and getting ready, it was years that she had this idea. Every time they were on tour, they stop, every city they stopped in, they'd check and see if there was a thrift store or if there was a tiki bar. And they'd go in and buy the the mugs, whatever mugs they could get. And so there's a really interesting and fun collection of tiki mugs on the top two shelves above our bar. You'll also notice in the uh, main area that there's a bunch of top-up cloth. Top-up cloth is made out of uh, a maple bark that's pounded flat and turned into very thin, beautiful paper and then painted. We have a, a bunch of top-up that was painted with a specific design that's unique to us. You need to us. It's the only place that we ever can see it. No, what about the food? You're having our ribs. They're in the guava glaze. Guava glaze. Pretty delicious. How did you like it? Pretty tasty. Good. You're also having one of Trader Vic's signature recipe in my time. We, we try to keep things as original as possible. We have uh, Don the Beachcomber's Zombies, and we also do his version of what well, he made him up. The, uh, he made up these names to make it racy, so it was the Missionary's Downfall, and the Virgin's Lament, and things like that. <laughs> Little things that he's just like, you know, you're going to have what? Is it safer? Probably not. I hope you should try it. Is it still in the next Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And See, Don the Beach was very interesting. His zombie mix, even his own bartenders didn't know what he was in. He would go in after hours and, and just like a mad scientist. I like to picture him in a lab coat with covered up. <laughs> but that's just the romantic image.